and um, we have an hour to talk together. So in the film, you actually explain a little bit of how you made your project sleep and what made you make it. And I thought it was really beautiful when your wife said that she was watching and listening to your concerts, streaming online, being at home with the kids while you were traveling the world. And she ended up listening to them being kind of in a state of half asleep. Yeah. So going in and out of slumber. Mm. And then she told you, and then you said that you had thought about the same mm. thing, a project. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about where you took it from there? Yeah. Um, so sleep is, um, yeah, it came out of this experience uh, that Yulia had. Just always watching this. And that, um, oh, there's some weird noise on the line. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so it came out of this experience Yulia had um, of, uh, listening to um, listening to the performances, you know, from a different time zone while she's kind of half asleep, um, and this chimed in with me with um, some ideas about um, uh, making a connection between music and the sleeping mind, yeah, and also some ideas about music with utility, um, you know we've sort of got a bit of a hangover from the romantic era, I think, and the kind of modernist era, that the idea of music with utility is somehow, you know, it's, it's sort of a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but actually, I mean, throughout music history, sort of pre-romantic and earlier, I mean, we've had this idea of music, you know, we have music to dance to, we have music to get married to, we have music to, you know, be buried or to go to war. You know, we, we, uh, you know, human cultures, in a way, acknowledge the fact that, you know, music can really move us and affect us and change our state of mind. And, you know, it's, it's a really powerful, um, uh, it's a really powerful, if you like, technology um, yeah. to transform and uh, transform consciousness and experience. So I wanted to make a piece which could provide a space to rest. Um, and also, in a sense, um, if you like, a barrier against the sort of data universe we've created for ourselves. Um, so sleep, in a way, is like a little capsule or some sort of vehicle to navigate the data universe and to provide a, a pause. So that's really what it is. Somebody's playing music now. I don't think people know what the mute button means. Yeah. Uh, they, they seem to want to interfere. <laughs> but uh, Max, I read that uh, somewhere that sleep is a bit of a protest music against yes. the very industrialized, exactly. mechanized uh, way of living right now. Yes, you know, yes. I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in music as being a, a way to have a conversation with the society we're, we're living in. Yeah. And therefore, you know, we, we talked about the idea of protest music sort of going back to, uh, for example, Woody Guthrie or, you know, some of that sort of first generation protest music of the 50s and 60s, um, which has a sort of activist stance, uh, which has a, a critical stance towards the culture at large. Um, as a way to provoke conversation and exchange. Um, and yes, we do have a kind of a, uh, a dominant uh, cultural view in terms of how human beings should be living and how we should be interacting with the world we've, we've made, which is a sort of, you know, late stage capitalist, neoliberal, um, you know, uh, individual as a object that produces and consumes, you know, <laughs> where that's it, you know, that's the whole game right there. Yeah. Uh, now that's very reductive. And, uh, you know, we wanted to make a piece which basically said, no, that's, that's not it. Um, there is something else. There's something bigger. There's something more fundamental, more human, uh, deeper, in fact, than just producing and consuming. Um, and that is super important. And music is a way to connect to that, exactly. uh, whatever we may call it. And creativity generally, in fact, is a way to connect to that. So therefore, we wanted to make a piece, I wanted to make a piece which 
would just open a door into that experience, something yeah. more fundamental. Yeah, wonderful. Because we say in the film that the, uh, the experience is not necessarily to be listened to, but to be experienced. I mean, the, exactly. the sleep project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And while watching the film, I got this very um, big feeling of uh, this sort of soothing feeling of kind of being taken care of almost. And, mm. and it's interesting how you were making uh, people were into you afterwards and they said they they felt safe and protected and kind of almost like in a cocoon did you envision that it would have that sort of effect yeah i mean that's very very deliberate in the music um you know the music the music uh, makes that happen in in a lot of different ways yeah. um first of all the material itself uses a lot of um, what you might call redundancy uh, in the informational space. So, so in other words, you're encountering things that you kind of already know. Mm. So it promotes a kind of feeling of existential safety. And I thought to myself, you know, if I'm, a, if I'm listening to a piece of music in the middle of the night, I wake up at 3.30, I want, I want to know where I am. You know, that's something yeah. very deep and human. We want to know where we are. So... I made music which has got very recognizable uh, structures. They're always changing. I mean, sleep is basically two sets of variations interlinked, A, B, A, B, A, B. And they're both, they're both in a way, very simple things and things which are recognizable. You know, one of them has this falling bass line and the other one has this sort of circling sort of pattern. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that you you wake up or you listening and you know where you are, you know where you are and you know where you're going. And yeah. that, you know, knowing where you are and knowing where you're going are things which, you know, are very rare in real life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, you know, in a piece of music, we can make this um, idealized universe. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that, it, that uh, promotes this feeling of, like you said, of a cocoon, is that the piece is modeled on a very specific spectrum, very specific frequency spectrum, in the sense that it's almost, there's basically hardly any high frequencies in it at all. Uh, and the way that works on us is I've, I've replicated or borrowed uh, the spectrum that the unborn child hears when it's inside the mother. So, the piece evokes this experience of that we've all had, every one of us, mm -hmm. before we were a conscious person. So we have this, this acoustic fingerprint of our, our really at the, our very beginning. Um, so I think that works very powerfully on us. It reminds us of, if you like, tabula rasa, you know, it's the very beginning. And I, I, what I wanted to do with sleep really was kind of wipe the slate clean, you know, just forget everything and let's start over. That's really what sleep is all about. Do you think um, that it would be, it's, it's great music maybe for pregnant people to listen to? I don't know. <laughs> That's an interesting idea. Yeah, That's an because, interesting idea. Yeah, because then... Yeah. Um, if it's the kind of frequencies a child hears maybe in the womb, it would be interesting to how to does it go. Yeah. Anyway, we're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did it come about that Natalie Johns wanted to make a documentary about this? Well, this is a thing which has been around for a long time, yeah. Um, Yulia and I were going to make a film about it at the beginning, and, and it was always the idea that Yulia was going to make the film. Yeah. Um, but strangely enough, over the years, we found there was a lot of resistance to that idea. And it was it was a sort of weird mix of kind of sexism and wifeism. A, a resistance <laughs> to wife making a documentary. Yeah, it was yeah. just sort of, you know, she's, you know, it, it was like there was this sort of strange assumption that somehow it wouldn't be any good if she made it from people who we were talking to about funding, you know? 
So yeah. it's this kind of weird, sexist, wifeist kind of prejudice, which, you know, is kind of, you know, it's 2021, right? Yeah. And it's, <laughs> and it's just know. like, how is this happening? And of course, it's happening everywhere. I mean, it, you know, it's crazy. So, so we found that we just really couldn't get it made. So what happened was that uh, Yulia ended up as, as producer and then worked with very closely with Natalie, uh, who came in and actually is brilliant. And Natalie did really well. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And um, so the film is, a, is, is actually sort of a collaboration between Natalie and Yulia and actually, you know, all the Super 8 stuff and all the kind of uh, archive performance uh, stuff in the film is actually Yulia's work. Mm. Um, and then Natalie filmed the LA show uh, and it's, you know, she did all the interviews with us and stuff, but it was, it was really, um, it was quite a long road. I mean, it took us like three years to get the film made mm. um, because yeah, strange times, you know. <laughs> I, I guess also you had to do a, a certain amount of performances maybe to, to film. Uh, well, we, we, I mean, we were always just capturing everything as we went along. So Yuli filmed Berlin, she filmed Sydney, she filmed um, one in Antwerp and various other places. Mm -hmm. um, and then Natalie did a kind of a, if you like, a proper kind of multi-camera shoot of the LA show. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I mean, those shots were really great. Mm. So um, you kind of teleport people into another world, I think, in, in sleep. Mm. Um, and possibly entering their dreams. And then I'm wondering, what about you when you sleep? Do you actually, do you dream about composing or music or how is your relationship to actual sleep and dream? Well, I'm, I mean, this is one of the reasons I made the piece is because I'm, I'm very lucky in that, you know, sleeping has pretty much always been my favorite activity. <laughs> Um, and I'm, it's it, probably what I'm best at as well. Yeah. I, I sleep like so well. Um, I, I literally will fall asleep 30 seconds after I go to bed and that's it, I'm out. You know, I never ever wake up in the night. I'm just very lucky in that way. So, and you know, I have this awareness obviously that, you know, we live in a culture which is chronically and increasingly sleep deprived. So I wanted to make a piece which would sort of provide an atmosphere in some way or a, a tool which would allow sleep to happen yeah yeah that's wonderful um and i'm we're not going to talk about sleep for the whole hour uh and about the film but i was wondering because it's so beautiful when the sun starts because you're all you know coming mm. together and then everyone is going to sleep and some mm. people are walking around and stretching and Mm. And you walk around in the middle of the show, maybe. Yeah. Um, and you have to stay awake all night performing. Mm. Mm. And then in the morning, it was like it was like a different feeling. And and in mm. the film, you you suddenly have this smile on your face by the piano. <laughs> yeah. Like and then and then it's this feeling of of sunrise, uh, mm. like regardless of of where you were. Mm. And then in the end, there's an applause. What does it feel like this, this morning of after a whole concert like that? Well, it's, it's really special for us because, you know, we all go on this journey together. And the piece is really, um, you really have a sense of a community going on a journey. You know, you have the listening community and the playing community and, they, and it, it just feels like we're doing this together. You know, and the, all the dynamics are, are shifted in sleep, you know, the traditional sort of hierarchies. You know, we're not, we're not musicians on a stage projecting a text which is supposed to be kind of received. What we're really doing is we're accompanying something that's happening in the room. So the audience are like, they're the, you know, if you like the theme or the subject of the piece is that, in, that sleeping experience of that community. And you're right, you know, as we get towards morning, what happens in the composition is that the spectrum opens up. So you get more high frequencies in the last hour or so. And that wakes people, you know, because that's just, that's yeah. the way the physiology works. So, and the last sequence of the piece is this sort of big sort of drone, 
which I, I sort of experience as a kind of blaze of light. You know, when I'm playing that music, it's this sort of G flat, huge drone. And by the time we get there, you know, everyone knows how the music is going to go. We just, we, everyone knows it. So it's like everyone's kind of doing it together. And it's really lovely. It's, a, it's an amazing moment for us. And, um, and then we get, you know, we get to the end and then we get this silence. And we feel as musicians that we've been working towards that silence for the eight hours, you know? Mm. So then there's this collective silence, which is, it's just so special. Because mm. uh, by the end of uh, the concert and towards the morning, it's like you've been playing for seven, eight hours mm. and you sat there kind of with a smile on your face, like, <laughs> like uh, and you didn't look tired. And I just thought that was very beautiful uh, and how it was quiet, like you said. Mm. Um, and there's something I think you're saying in the film, like, it's a longing as well as a belonging. Uh, and I think that's very beautiful and kind of wraps uh, sort of something around this, this project. And I must say that anyone who hasn't seen the film, I felt like I experienced almost the same as the sleeping audience by cool. watching the yeah. film. Yeah, I mean, I think the film does evoke the project really beautifully. And I think, you know, that's a, it's a tribute to Natalie's um, sort of passion for it really. I mean, she really, um, she spent such a long time on it, particularly in post-production. And I think it does tell the story of, of, the, of the piece really well. Mm, absolutely. Just briefly, uh, I didn't uh, ask you about the neuroscientist that you uh, spoke to about mm. the project. Is there anything you'd like to add there? Anything that, that he told you or revealed or, you talked about that. that um, you. Well, not not really. Um, I mean, I guess I I, I uh, I'm friends with David Eagleman, who's a he's a neuroscientist and he's written a lot on uh, sort of memory and information and perception, all kinds of things like that. Um, and really, I just sort of had a dialogue with him about the kinds of things I wanted to do from a musical standpoint, because you know, as a composer, I had you know, ideas about what music should be that you're supposed to sleep through. In a way we, you know, the lullaby, we all have these ideas. It's in a way obvious what it should be um, from a musical standpoint, but uh, I just wanted to check in with him that that was actually true. And I just wasn't doing something which is a terrible idea from a neuroscience point of view. So, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Mm. Well, uh, they do say though that mathematics and music are hand in hand and sure. probably sure. science science and music as well. Of course, yeah. yeah. So uh, yes, we will leave this, uh, what you call a lullaby for a frantic world for now. And like I said, I recommend everyone to watch the film. And also I will post a link where you can actually download the Sleep app, which is also Max's creation which you can use um, on your phone so i'll post this in the chat uh, next to the to the talk here so let's talk more about film music there's a lot of aspiring film composers here and also established film composers here and filmmakers how did it happen that you ended up uh, making music to picture uh this was uh, accidental <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I never trained, you know, to do film music. Uh, I, I've had a very straightforward sort of classical music background, really, both as a composer and as a performer. And um, the way this happened was that I, I got this email from somebody I didn't know uh, in Israel called Ari Folman. He said, "I've, you know, I've been listening to your... I think it was the Blue Notebooks. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been listening to it for four days <laughs> continuously and I've written this film and, and now you have to write the score for the film. So, um, so I kind of thought he was a, probably just crazy, you know. Um, but anyway, so he sent me this animatic 30 seconds uh, of Waltz with Bashir and uh, a sketch, you know, just which... Uh, just a kind of a, a proof of concept really and I thought it was 
absolutely amazing. I thought it was absolutely incredible. You know that feeling when you you see something and you know it's great. Um, I had that feeling. I just thought this is this is great. Um, it was you know super innovative, incredibly beautifully executed, really intelligent, really powerful, really emotional. And I just thought this is this is fantastic. So so I said yeah okay I'll do that. Um, so. Um, we managed to get together and talk a lot about it. And I had never written film music, really. Mm. I'd done a few tiny bits and pieces, but nothing substantial. And I had no idea how to do it. And, you know, so basically what happened is he, he, um, he sent me the script and I wrote pretty much all the music just off the script. And then it, it went back and forth a little bit. Um, because you have that luxury with animation because they move quite slowly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we spent probably, I don't know, about a year on it or something, back and forth. And... Um, so was, that, was uh, that the first film you did? Yeah, it was the first... Yeah, it was, I think, yeah. 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 I mean, I'd done a couple of small things before, but, yeah, that was the first actual movie, yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful film. Uh, I mm. saw. I actually was recommended this film uh, when it uh, had been out for a while by Guy Sigsworth. He loved oh, yeah. that film, <laughs> and uh, he he loved the music in it. And, mm. and I I had no idea about uh, uh, things back then. Mm. But it's a wonderful film, animated um, documentary mm. style. Mm. Um, how did you, I mean, you said you, you got the script and you wrote most of the, the cues mm. from there. Yeah. Is that, uh, would that repeat itself? Like, is that how you prefer to work, to get involved as early as possible? Or do you often get sent like uh, a locked uh, edit? Depends, really. Um, it's quite, I think it's, there's sort of no single best way, I think, to do a thing. Um, I think each project has its own sort of dynamics inside it in terms of the kind of optimum way to to get to, you know, the best work. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can spend a long time with, with a project and it's really, you know, looking back, you've basically wasted most of that time and it didn't sort of, you didn't really get to it until the deadline started yeah. kind of coming towards you, you know? Um, and the deadline is... A great motivator uh yeah. one way and another um and you know sometimes it can be great to write a lot of stuff off the page and sometimes yeah like you say you know here's the cut and you know let's have it um that's also that's also fine you know it just it just depends it's very much about the people actually you know the kinds of conversations you can have with the director and producers and editor and whatever yeah and how how was it uh, uh... <laughs> Let's talk about another film you did, uh, Ad Astra, mm. which is a film in space. Yeah. It's also like, usually your, your, the films you've done are usually interesting places. <laughs> right, well, right, okay. And even was for Bashir, even though mm. it's sort of in Israel, it's mm. animated, so it's mm. like its own world. Yeah, it really and, is. Uh, mm. Ad Astra is, uh, is in space. And how yeah. was that... Uh, how was it to work on that compared to uh, Walls for Bashir? Um, well, I mean, creatively, uh, I was working with James Gray, who is, you know, a fantastically smart guy. He's a really, uh, a, a, you know, really wonderful filmmaker and very smart about music and very interested in you know, all, you know, any idea that can be brought to the table. Yeah. And that project was, it was really fun to do because I had a reasonable amount of time on it because the post-production was very long because of all the VFX. Um, so then you have time to experiment, you know, and so we, we did some wonderful things with it. Uh, you know, I had, uh, for example, I mean, people who don't know the film, but basically the film is a journey from Earth to the edge of the solar system. So thinking about how um, the music could 
uh, work in the film, I realized that we've actually made that journey and we have data gathered all along the way. Uh, and that's with the Voyager probes, which left in the 1770s and have just left the solar system just now actually. And they, they made recordings every few seconds and sent them back to earth. So we have this massive library of data, uh, which the University of Iowa have. So I got in touch with the University of Iowa and said, can we have, can we have your Voyager data please? because I want to turn it into musical instruments. And they were quite into that idea. Uh, so we have we basically got all the data and allowed us to um, make musical instruments, which, you know, when Brad is flying past, you know, Mars or Saturn or Jupiter, it allowed me to make the music from data gathered at the site. So... Wow. So when he's going by Saturn, you're hearing material, not just recordings, because there are magnetic uh, field recordings, but actually an instrument, which is a kind of a sculptural embodiment of that place. Uh, so it's almost like a location recording. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, location recording in space. Yeah. <laughs> that's, quite, so, that's quite interesting. So that was, you know, that's the kind of thing that it's just when you have time, you know, you can do that. Yeah, that's um, amazing. Yeah. I, I posted a link here in the chat for the, the soundtrack and, and the trailer. I know it's not all your music in the trailer, but some of it is. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Trailers <laughs> are, are often, they, they will add some yeah. symphonies and <laughs> big... <laughs> Tra trailer, yep, trailer yeah, things. Trailer music. Yes. But there's some of your music there as well. Yeah. So I'm adding this so, so the audience can listen to these mm. things as we speak or after. Mm. Um, Another yeah. thing, I, I, I just want to talk about something that I personally love and something which is some of my favorites that you've done to picture. And that's all the music for The Leftovers. Mm. I absolutely yeah. love the series. And I, yeah. I, and I realize a lot of my love for the show is actually the music. Mm. It, it's the music and story and picture melting together. Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't be the same if I turned off the, the music. Right. So the music drags me into this world and it triggers the emotions of, mm. of, of the actors and everything. Mm. How do you work? How did you work with a series like that? Which is, I think it's two mm. seasons. Mm. And yeah. Um, three, yeah. Yeah. There are three seasons on the leftovers. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I mean, the thing about uh, uh, the leftovers was that, you know, every element of that show I thought was just absolutely fantastic. You had a sort of community of people who were just doing incredibly good work. I mean, Damon, um, whom people may know from Lost, you know, he, he's, he's a very, very, very clever writer. And him and Tom cooked up this material and you know, when you get a script and you're just like, oh, it's a script, I'm reading the script. But the leftovers, the writings just sort of leapt off the page. It was just, yeah. the writing was just so good, you know, I just wanted to turn the page. And, and um, he, you know, he's sort of quite, in a way, he's sort of quite cheeky, you know, because, you know, he'll write a scene and then, you know, on the bottom of page three, it'll say insane Max Richter music starts playing, you know, and you're just like, <laughs> that's sort of cheating, right? When he's trying to get, but anyway, so that he's kind of fun like that, but, yeah. but basically he's, um, that show had such a strong uh, basic theme and identity, which is obviously the loss and the disappearance. It allowed me uh, to play with that idea from a musical standpoint in a very direct way. So I felt like the theme of the show gave me my palette in the sense that I didn't want to use sounds which could be sustained. So I just used sounds which disappear, you know, like piano notes, harps, bells, you know, these kinds of things where you, the event happens and then it goes away because the theme of the, the show is the disappearance, you know, all these people who have just disappeared from the earth for no reason. And the other thing that's, so that gave me my palette. And the other thing about, uh, um, about the leftovers is none of the questions are ever answered. 
Um, and that for a composer is fantastic, you know, because it means that all the material can kind of float in this unresolved way. Mm. Um, and, and yet it, it, it can be emotional, which is, uh, it was perfect. It's so I love that. Emotional. I love that show. <laughs> yeah, I love it too. And I have seen, it, <laughs> seen the season a few times and I still, mm. I recorded little bits on, of conversation and mm. music on my mm. iPhone. So it's, it really takes me into a different world. Mm. Yeah. How do you relate to the characters? Like when you, like when I scored films, I get mm. very attached to the character and I kind of mm. fall in love with them a little bit. Yeah, do yeah. Do you, you get attached to the characters? Oh yeah, completely. You sort of have to in a way. You know, it, it's it's a strange thing working on, on uh, films, isn't it? Because you have to, in a way, you sort of have to believe it at mm. some level. Um, otherwise you can't do your best work, you know, if you're just sort of sitting back and going, you know, oh, it's that point of view and the time has to pass at that speed and, and now we're, you know, then, then it's kind of, there's no alchemy there. You know, you have to, you do have to kind of enter that world and discover it from the inside. And how was it then to get season two and three like were you hoping for like oh I hope she's going to be okay or like were you hoping well, for to happen or you know? I mean you know I I, I, I hoped but I kind of knew that it would never yeah <laughs> it's, you know it just yeah is it a series is it a book series it's based on originally? well they did the I mean Tom wrote the first season is basically Tom's novel and then they wrote the, the second two seasons together yeah, yeah. Mm. So uh, when they, yeah, mm. and that, that show is on HBO Nordic for for us Nordics. Absolutely <laughs> so amazing. That's where show. where the audience could see this series, mm. The Leftovers, which is an amazing series with mm. amazing music, and you will want to watch it several times. Um, it's almost like uh, I feel your music becomes an additional character in the series. Have you thought about that? Like, in an, it's like a, the glue or a sort of yeah. an invisible character. Well, I, I do feel like, um, I mean, one of the things that I'm trying to do with, with, with uh, music in a, uh, you know, a, a film or a TV project or, you know, is I'm trying to discover the music, which feels like it is a, an innate part of the texture of that universe, something which belongs completely in that world and emanates from it. Uh, that, that sort of feeling like any physical object in that world or the force of gravity or the wind or, you know, that sort of, you want to try and discover something which has that feeling of authenticity and, and essentialness in that world. That for me is sort of, you know that it's almost the most important thing you know so 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 it feels like a piece of furniture that just is in a scene it's just there um so that 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 kind of and that there's a sort of there's sort of no single way to get to that experience i think because obviously you know composing is very it's an intellectual discipline it's a very cognitive and you know, there's a lot of kind of strategy involved, if you like, uh, but also it has, you, you know, you need an experimental approach really to just sort of find things. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost a process of discovery, I think, mm -hmm. to find the, the voice of that world uh, that you're trying to write into. So you kind of discover the music of the film or show as you work on it or sort of as you, you see it yeah well I think so I mean like that you know that the there's two or three little uh, kind of main groups of material in the leftovers and as soon as I I'd sort of found that music which is is sort of called the departure and you know there are various very there's some variations on it as soon as I found that it just it just sort of locked together with the show in my brain mm. I was just like well that's it that is it that's the sound of that world mm. Yeah, and then you have several variations on that theme, which are all sure. all gorgeous as well. Oh, thank you. Um, what was I gonna say? And uh, is it hard to let go of a project like that? 
which, be, which becomes <laughs> such a big part of you. Well, it's funny because all, I think all of us who worked on The Leftovers, because it was so great, um, but because there were only three seasons, I think we all felt, oh, you know, can't we just keep making The Leftovers? Yeah. It's, <laughs> no. you know, it's just so great. Why are we stopping doing this, you know? I think all um, of felt that too. Yeah. So um, uh, what makes you actually pick a project? I mean, you must have lots of offers of films mm. and series that people yeah. want you to score. What, what actually makes you want to do a project? Well, um, I just, I like to do things which feel important to me in some way. Um, and so, yeah, important stories. Um, stories which I want to be part of and which feel like they're going to illuminate something that matters to me. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the screen projects I've done over the years are have a kind of what kind of socio-political yeah, orientation, yeah. you know? I've noticed it's a lot of political themes yeah. in the albums. I mean, yeah, I mean that's that's important. You know, I think of yeah, creative work is is a place to have conversations about the important stuff in the world. Yeah, and yeah. humanity and yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically what, what's, you know, yeah. those are the kinds of things I gravitate towards, yeah. Yeah, it's your instinct like that. Mm. Mm. And it, it sort of uh, strikes me as well that, I mean, out of interest, does any of the directors uh, ever put a temp track on the, the film you are going to score? Uh, yeah, quite often. Yeah? I mean, that's, often. the thing is, editors really need it. They really can't. They really can't sort of get somewhere, you know. They just need something to kind of hang the edit around. And um, I don't think I would dare to put a temp track if I well, had you score the film. <laughs> well, you know, I don't mind it because it's actually a good way to have a conversation. You know, it's like, well, you know, this temp is doing this, but I like that about it. I don't like that about it. La la la. You know, and then, you know, you can either ignore that or, or not. And yeah. I think it's a, you know, as long as people don't get hung up on it. Um, you know, that's obviously the big sort of danger, isn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, you, you do it sometimes you do get into conversations where where you sort of have to remind the filmmakers that the audience haven't been listening to the temp for a year. You know, <laughs> yeah. they're not used to it right yeah. it's only you guys yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so um because i think even... yeah no sorry i i mean i think i just i think the temp you know they they editors just need it i mean there's no there's sort of no getting away from it no it seems that uh, that the directors they would only want you to sound like yourself because they would only hire you if they want right. your sound because you have a very specific sound yes. so hiring you and saying can you make something that sounds like Hans Zimmer would be sort of very strange it, thing to do. That's a different thing isn't it? <laughs> I mean I, 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 one thing that happens to me is that is that I get the temp will be sort of me it'll be me sort of other things which mm. is in a way kind of more difficult mm. because you know I've sort of already done that and you know to make another version of that piece which yeah that, that's more difficult actually yeah you, you don't want to repeat yourself well yeah but but then again uh, in the leftovers there are some compositions from your albums yes uh, mm. did you rework those or is that how the the director no, no they just wanted uh november comes up quite a bit from memory house and yeah. there's a couple of other things which come out yeah. yeah so that that was those were choices they made you know they wanted those yeah. pieces one. Which is, yeah, it's great. Yeah. We're uh, just in a minute going to have like a Q&A and the audience great. would write me the questions in the chat. Sure. So audience, feel free to start writing questions. Um, but I just wanted to briefly uh, talk about your, there's so much I would love to talk about. I would love to talk about the four seasons, Recomposed, yeah. 
which is amazing. Thank you. And I would also love to talk about, uh, you know, politics and personal life because you have so many political um, subjects in your album, but also personal growing up themes mm. together, which is interesting. But uh, let's talk about your latest album, Voices. Yeah. Which... Uh, how did it come by that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that was the inspiration for the record, as far as I've read? Yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, this, this piece is a, it's a piece which has been a, sort of floating around about 10 years or so. Um, I wrote this little piece, Mercy, for Hilary Hahn about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was in response, really, to the events of Guantanamo, of that, that moment. And then over the years, Yulia and I have been talking about making a big audiovisual piece mm. to uh, kind of celebrate the Universal Declaration. Um, and during the kind of Trump years, uh, it just felt more and more urgent <laughs> yes, <laughs> as uh, things were getting, you know, it was like it was like an airplane in a kind of nosedive. And we're like, we've really got to get this record out. We've really <laughs> got to do something. Yeah, exactly. um, so... So, yeah, in 2018 or 19, um, we made the recordings uh, and started sort of really uh, making this piece. So um, it was originally going to be a kind of audiovisual album, you know, uh, so full length film. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, unfortunately, I, I just it just took me longer to write the music than I thought it was going to be. So it's now this sort of collaboration, but in series rather than in parallel. So Yulia has been making the films now bit by bit and the record came out. Um, so yeah, the record is a is really um, a space to reflect on the text of the Universal Declaration. Yeah. And um, it has recordings from 1949 uh, so Eleanor Roosevelt, who is one of the framers of the, cons uh, of the uh, document, uh, reads a preamble and then Kiki Lane reads the articles and there are voices from all around the world mm. uh, reading the texts in, I guess we have 70 languages on the record. Mm. Um, and yeah, that's it. It's very, um, I get the feeling from now I've, I've sort of, I mean, I've been familiar with your music for a very long time, but not so much as with you as a person. And I get the feeling of you, you've got sort of altruistic wishing people well. It's, it seems, uh, you know, both sleep, which is kind of like a, wrapping a blanket around everyone. Mm. And also this declaration of, of human rights and, it mm. feels, uh, yeah, it feels like, do you feel like this is part of your mission to make the world a better place? Well, I think that's what creativity is about. Mm. You know, I mean, this may not be a very fashionable view in the sort of modernist uh, universe, but, you know, I, I think creativity is, is fundamentally a, a something which can elevate our day-to-day -day experience. You know, if you read a novel that you enjoy, it transports you into another world, you encounter another mind, you learn about things, you know, or if an art gallery, you spend time looking at a painting or you listen to a piece of music, you know. Yeah. Um, these are things which can, you know, make, make the world a tiny bit better for a tiny moment. Um, yeah. And that, you know, that to me is, it is a tiny thing, but it's also a big thing. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, it's, that for me is really important. And, you know, if I didn't believe music could do that, then I kind of probably wouldn't be doing it. You know, I, I think it's, you know, it's, I think it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big, tiny thing. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I think it's a big thing and I think it's a, a beautiful thing as well. So yeah. thank you for doing that. Um, we're going to go to the questions. The questions are pouring in here. Um, there is uh, Ulrich, uh, he is asking if you can talk a little bit about your work on Hostiles. Right, mm. yeah, Hostiles was, uh, so this is an amazing Western made by Scott Cooper with Christian Bale. It's the first Western I've ever done. And yeah, it's, it's a- unusual. Yeah, really, but the thing is it's a, 
it's a really classical sort of uh, approach to the genre. Although really the film is about reconciliation. It, the film is about overcoming difference, which is kind of why I you know, was so drawn to it. The performances are astonishing. I mean, Scott Cooper is a wonderful director and Christian Bale is an amazing actor. Mm. Rosamund Pike as well, stunning in that film. So the big thing in that film is trying to find, because the, the film is a story about a journey across the desert and then metaphorically a journey, you know, across a kind of arid, prejudiced way of looking to the, of the world towards something more uh, complete and humane. So the big thing in that, in that score is the, uh, the voice of the desert, the voice of the earth, trying to find something which will kind of make that, all that desert imagery sort of come to life. And I came across this instrument called a yebaha, made by this guy who lived in who lives in um, in Turkey. I'm not exactly sure now where he lives in Turkey. He's a man called uh, Gorkam Sen. He's invented this, um, he's a cellist originally, and he's invented this enormous sculptural instrument made of sort of metal resonators. And it's, it's an instrument which is, I mean, it's room sized. It's absolutely enormous. And uh, it has a kind of a cello-ish aesthetic, but it feels almost like an, when you hear it, you think, oh, this is an electronic instrument. So it has this kind of resonant out of control tonal sort of quality. And I just thought it's the best thing I've ever heard in my life. I loved it so much. I spotted this. Can you say this, again the name of it? It's called a Yaibaha, Y-A-Y-B-A-H-A-R. And he's called Gorkam Sen. So, so basically, um, we went over to, um, uh, to Istanbul and, and just recorded loads and loads of him playing his, his amazing instrument because it can't really be moved. I mean, you know, wow. he, has to, he has to build it. Um, <laughs> now I want to see. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. So, so basically, so we then came back and programmed it all up into the computer. And so, so then um, I used this sound to evoke this kind of, um, this sort of hostile earth, you know, um, that mm, they're traversing. Yeah. So, yeah. Which is the opposite of, of sleep and, and voices, which is right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So um, thank you for that. Um, and then uh, Ines de Castro, she is asking if, could Max please share the process of composing for ballet? Because you've done quite a lot of ballet as yes, well. Yes, I love the ballet. Um, uh, for me, uh, working in the ballet is is um, just a it's a great pleasure because my world normally is full of text. You know, uh, I, I you know whether it's musical text or you know just you know I read all the time. I'm very interested in story and narrative, and my world is just very text based. And for me, the experience um, of being around dancers is completely text-free. Uh, and I love it because of that. It's like being on holiday. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm because, I, I mean, this would be different for a dancer, of course, because they read movement in the way that, you know, we read a score. So, but for me, it's this foreign country which I get to visit and I don't really understand it, but I love what's going on around me. Um, and I love the, the way that, you know, dancers, physicality, choreography conveys, it conveys feeling and emotion yeah. and human experience in this way, which is, it's a little like music in the sense that we can't say, you know, that C sharp makes me feel, you know, anxious or sad or happy. We can't do that in a piece of music, but, and yet it does, you know, and, um, it does have an effect, but we don't know where that effect lives. Um, it's the same in, 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 in ballet, you know, there is this, there is this sort of transporting uh, quality it has. Um, and I just enjoy being around it. Um, yeah, um, I'm a big fan of myself of Wayne McGregor. Yeah, and, he's amazing. Uh, <laughs> I remember his Swan Lake and a few mm. other shows. Yeah, uh, in London, and I love, love his performances. And you've yeah. been lucky enough. Is that your main 
collaborator for stage and ballet. Yeah, uh, we've done a, a lot. Um, I'm and actually why? doing, uh, we're supposed to have done another one this year, but it got pushed because of the pandemic. Um, so we're working on that now for next year, mm. um, which, uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. Exciting. Okay, so another question uh, from Christina Haas. Um, which film was the most challenging to find so, like, which film did you struggle the most to find? Your, yeah. Or to the, the soul of film? Yeah, I, you're not... I, Sort of only hearing What's every other word, Kate. Uh, I don't know if <laughs> I'm it, I don't, yeah. Are you saying it's a question? It's of, part of the challenge, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Decode the question. Um, is the um, decode it. Yeah. So, so which film was most difficult to do? Is that is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Basically. Um, yes. I don't know, really. Um, I mean, in a way, every project is kind of impossible at the beginning. Yes. You know, you, you kind of, you start it and you think, why did I get into this? You know, <laughs> why this is, I can't do this, it's impossible. You know, and the, 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 you've got a blank sheet of paper in front of you and it's just like, oh my God, you know. Not again, you know, <laughs> this is sort of feeling of like, I just don't know, I just don't know what to do. And it's always like that. Um, but, uh, you know, you spend time with it, you, you let it sort of percolate in your brain while you're making a cup of coffee or something, and you slowly ideas start to come together and, you know, that's it. Um, I, I think they're all kind of all, it's all difficult in a way. It, I mean, it is, you know. I love that you use the word percolate. Uh, <laughs> I've heard another composer use that, and I love the the fact that you can just let your thoughts and ideas percolate about the project before you actually start. It's a it's a nicer word than procrastinate. <laughs> yeah, but I but I think it's also you know that I mean consciousness is peculiar, isn't it? I mean, there's all sorts of stuff going on under the hood that we have no idea about, mm. and you know just a certain amount of time needs to pass between going, you know what, I want to write this mm. and you, and your mind being sort of prepped for that. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily happen immediately. I mean, sometimes it does, but yeah. you know, often it's just about, you know, spending a few days just thinking and then, Oh, okay. There it is. You know, then it all starts to just happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. I just, uh, there's a comment from Matthew Costello who says, as a humanitarian, humanitarian worker, thank you for voices one and two. Oh, thank you. So oh, you pleasure. are making uh, uh, definitely a, a big mark out there. Um, another question is, what is, this is from Oliver, what's your advice for people starting out in film composing? Um. I don't really know. I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, I think it. you sort of have to decide what kind of artist you want to be, you know, and, and um, I mean, this, I'm just really just speaking for myself here. I, you know, I think it, it's about trying to be the, the kind of most authentic and best version of yourself. Mm. And, you know, concentrate on developing your, your voice, your technique, your, your language, and just sort of get better. Um, mm. You know, I think there's no, you know, there isn't, I mean, again, speaking personally, you know, there isn't any replacement for just hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes. hours and hours and hours you know are just just getting better and getting and getting better at being you and making your sound because actually you know obviously within film music there are all kinds of different um if you like traditions from a sort of a kind of classicized sort of mid-century language to a sort of what you might call a kind of 
uh, the kind of remote control type language, or you know, there there are ways of you know, kind of methods, um, it, and you know, decide how, where you fit in that spectrum, or if you do mm. at all, and then really, really concentrate on making your voice and just as clear as you can. Yeah. Wonderful. We have uh, one last question uh, from Luigi Ferry. Did you consider using binaural beats for sleep to help the listener to switch brain waves to the alpha delta frequency range? Um, we looked into all kinds of things. Um, I mean, the thing about those kinds of things are they're, they're quite um, dependent on uh, playback, very specific playback conditions, which you can't really do in a big auditorium or outside or, you know. Um, but one thing which, um, which I guess is, is a little bit similar is that uh, one of the... Um, sets of variations in sleep is based around this repetitive low frequency pulse. Um, and that does actually, you get this sort of rhythmic entrainment where sort of brain cycles actually sort of lock into that. Um, and that helps with a memory consolidation and learning and all these kinds of things. So, so there is some of that kind of material in sleep. Yeah. Similar. It's not not really binaural, but, but similar. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Um, another question here. And how? Um, what do you do to keep this stream of creativity? Because you seem to go from one thing to the next to the next. There is like a constant sort of. Yeah. Stream. Well. Uh, don't know really. Um, I mean, for me. You know, I, I've, I'm very fortunate in a way in that I've never been in a, in a position where kind of the music has stopped, really. It's always just kind yeah. of, you know, it's always just going around in my head, whatever it is. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess I just, I've just got a lot of ideas that I want to explore. Um, for me, it's, uh, you know, I started in music when I was a tiny child and I, you know, I had my toys and whatever, toy cars or whatever it was, you know, bricks, building blocks, and I would play with those. And, and I also had a bit of music going around in my head and I would play with that. And the next day I would pick up my blocks and pick up the piece of music. You know, I thought that was normal. Mm. Um, but, it, you know, I, later on I discovered, well, that's composing and that's, you know, that's a, a thing you can do. Um, but I, I, I've always just sort of feel like that kind of, you know, it's that sort of creative playfulness mm. is is a good space, really. Good to hear. So there will be no breaks. <laughs> we will continuously be getting <laughs> from you. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Um, you talked a little bit about your sound palette, and there's a question from Fabrizio. Um, mm. What is, what's your thought process of picking your timbres, instruments, and the sound palette for each time you start a new project or film? Mm. Like, how do you choose what instruments to use? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I mean, I guess there are specific things like um, to do with the texture of the story and the universe that it's inhabiting, like, you know, I was mentioning the instruments and the leftovers all have decay and then they go to nothing or um, a film like the same as Sloan, uh, which is a sort of um, anti NRA film, I guess, a sort of anti gun, yeah. gun lobby movie with Jessica Chastain. And that, that felt like, you know, that film is all about an organization uh, against a person. So mm. now I thought about what, what is an organization? Organization is a structure. So basically all of that, all of the mu music in Miss Slane, which is, as it were, against her, is built on um, kind of nested grids. It's kind of informational. So there's a lot of pulsation. There's a lot of uh, things which are kind of patterns. 
Mm. Um, and that's a sort of metaphor for this organization, if you like. Yeah. So you've got, you've got sort of patterns against a person, grids against a person. And she is a kind of, she's this kind of free human against these patterns and grids. It's that kind of thing, you know? So I'm looking for something, I'm looking for something in the story that I can, that the music can evoke or embody in a very fundamental way. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just a way to kind of start my thinking mm. in a sense. And it's also a good way to discover what the project is really about at a deep level, you know? Um, yeah. So, um... Uh, another question is, in your music, you've used texts by Kafka, uh, Czeslav Milos and Murakami, mm. uh, amongst others. Uh, what draws you to these writers and to their texts? Uh, well, different reasons, really. Um, I mean, I love stories and the human voice obviously is very, you know, super emotional. It's very, you know, you feel that there's a kind of a human connection when you hear someone speak. Um, I mean, the Kafka came out, um, came about really because of the subject matter of the Blue Notebooks, you know, the Blue Notebooks is a sort of anti-Iraq war protest album. And at the time, you know, from in the UK, at least the justification for the, the, the invasion of Iraq was just, they just invented it. It was a load of rubbish. It just made it up. <laughs> so, so, so therefore, you know, Kafka as the kind of high priest of the absurd and he just seemed perfect for the to kind of frame that the music, you know, um, this this idea that we were moving. Well, now we speak of post truth politics, but and that was sort of the beginning of that in a way. So that's why Kafka there. Yeah. Um, Murakami, I, I just love Murakami's writing. Uh, no other reason. He's a wonderful writer. He's also quite you know he's into music. He's a very musical guy. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was. Um, yeah, that was that one. And, you know, there, I, I, you know, I love literature, so. Yeah, exactly. And how about, um, this is always interesting for a composer. Do you listen, what music do you listen to? Like, do you have a favorite composer, <laughs> you know, or do you, some composers don't really listen to music. Yeah, I know I listen to music, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, favorite composers, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess, I mean, I, it's hard to say, I mean, I was going to say Bach, but I mean, Bach is like, it's, he's sort of beyond favorite or not favorite, you know, mm -hmm. Bach is like, it's like talking about Mount Everest. It's just there, you know, it's like, yeah. you, there's no point having an opinion about that. <laughs> yeah, 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 It's yeah. just like, so yeah, I mean, I, obviously I listen to Bach, I play Bach a lot, you know, just personally on the piano. And so he's the kind of alpha and omega in a way. Mm. But uh, I listen to a lot of classical music and uh, a lot of Renaissance music, actually. I like a lot of early music. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, the same people everyone loves, you know, <laughs> yeah. Beethoven, Mahler, Schubert, you know, Purcell. Um, you, probably, you listen to a lot of classical music. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And a lot of other things, a lot of electronic music, a lot of jazz and yeah, all kinds. And what can we... Um... We're soon going to wrap up here, um, but I'm wondering what can we expect from Max Richter in the future? What is your next step? Uh, I just saw you're doing a short film. Am I? Um, maybe. <laughs> ah, maybe. <laughs> I'll email you about that later. <laughs> no, uh, maybe I, I found the wrong uh, information online. It was just IMDb. Oh yeah, they yeah. You don't want to believe what you see on my TV. Right? I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm doing a I'm doing a show for a, it's a ten parter uh, for Apple TV, um, which is the next screen project, which is is really a lovely show. Um, and then later on in the year, there's a there's a movie. Oh. And um, and next year there will be a new ballet with Wayne McGregor. Um, and that's for, for the Royal Ballet. Um, and um, that's a collaboration with Margaret Atwood mm. on um, her, you know, the, the, she wrote a trilogy of novels, Mad Adam, uh, which is this wonderful dystopian classic Atwood mm -hmm. uh, material. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. 
Are there any books that you would love to see being made into a film and score? Well, uh, I don't know. I mean, 1922 is kind of a big year for literature. So 2022, yeah. we've got Ulysses, we've got Mrs. Dalloway, we've got The Wasteland. You know, there's, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people. Yeah, there's a lot, lots of music to be written on literary yeah. themes uh, next yeah. year. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think we have to say thank you for, for now. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see you again at some point. And thank sure. you. We, we, we don't actually have time to answer all the questions, which... I apologize to the viewers, uh, to the audience, uh, that it, it was really, there was so many questions, it was hard to actually pick them because some of them were very long. Mm -hmm. So I picked the ones that I think uh, were the most um, uh, best to, to for the session. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank you so much and I wanna wish you good luck with your uh, projects. Uh, and give our love to your your family and Julia and her Thank beautiful uh, artwork and for uh, voices and all your other projects. And we, um, yeah, we will look forward to hear uh, more of your music in the future and see your films. And I also want to tell the audience that if you want to save the chat and save all the links in the chat then you can, because when we close the session, it will disappear if you haven't actually saved it. Uh, it's on the bottom right, um, save chat. So you can do that and save it on the computer. Um, yeah, so, so thank you so much. And we didn't get to chat about how it's been during the lockdown, but I'm sure you've had plenty of time to speak about that. So yeah. we kind of skipped it this time. Uh, uh, the um, the organizer, she actually had one question about okay. the machine behind you. Oh yeah, what um, is that? Yeah, that's a it's a so it's a modular synthesizer. It's a uh, it's kind of uh, it's like the Saturn V rocket of synthesizers. It's kind of from the same era. It says 1970 synthesizer. It's a Moog uh, System 55, um, yeah. which is kind of um, yeah, it's pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> I know modular synths are fantastic. Yeah, so. it's um, it's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. We should all have a wall of those. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's all right. One. Well, thank you so much. And we'll be in touch and uh, take care for now. Thank you. And Good to talk to you. Bye-bye and thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Okay. Bye. 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 We have screened uh